Hello, my name is Paul Campbell, and I will continue to read Messages to the Millennials by Brother Riza Islam. Social media. Now, I think it is safe to say that we can all agree and come to a consensus and one full understanding when we look at the fact that social media is not free. Yes, we know that the media was meant to be free and not to be infringed upon. It is considered to be the fourth state, a state. The Constitution is supposed to protect the right to privacy. It is supposed to protect the rights and freedom of communication between persons and groups, organizations, and even state, cities, states, and countries. However, however, where there is free access to information, there will always be those who seek to control and manipulate that information to benefit their vet vested interests, especially if the information which is being passed along has the capability of being monetized for financial aid. Social media was supposed to be a tool for the common good and the common freedom of the people to simply communicate horizontally between each other. Rather than vertically, up and down, like how the government controlled information from the top down rather than the bottom up, Social media is supposed to be just that, social. However, when information became too accessible, it ex exposed this government to a new level of apparent vulnerability. Information, particularly about government documentation, international affairs, and top secret data, data were revealed. It was not something they expected because they never wanted the public to be able to access their information, but they wanted to have access to the public's information all in the name of a national security. Pray, now what pray tell, you may ask, was it that, was it that sparked social media and it's monitored and no longer simply being free? Or well, interestingly, enough when social media was started if you look at the timeline, can coincidentally, it would, if we would like to use such a phrase, an event occurred which sparked a major shift in how information was to be used. In 1997, the world's first social network site called Six Degrees was created. It was indeed the first network working site which allowed people to make individual profiles and add others to their personal network. It was officially launched in, it was officially launched in 1997 and lasted upon up until about 2001, having a peak of nearly 3.5 million users. Now in 2001, something happened. I believe it was September the 11th, the Twin Tower bombing on what they referred to as a terrorist attack. If you do not know what truly happened on that day, that is something that you absolutely must learn because 9-11 has been known to be one of the most, if not the greatest, justifier to invade foreign nations and destroy the constitutional protections for its citizens, as well as destroy the security of sovereign foreign nations on the name of national security and the protection of Amer American citizens. All a lie. There are over 2,000 engineers calling for the reopening of the files dealing with 9-11 due to there being so many scientific inaccuracies, far too many things to name he here, but let us get back to social me media. After 2001, Six Degrees was shut down and in March of 2002, Friendster was launched. In July of 2002, Friendster reaches nearly 3 million users. Very interesting. And in May of 2003, the image sharing site known as PhotoBucket is launched. Millions of users are now sharing photos and uploading images of themselves onto the World Wide Web. Now, rem now remember in 2001, after 9-11, something else happened that was extremely vital that would that we should all know about. The Fourth Amendment, a 
of the United States Constitution protects the right to privacy. It states that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, house, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause and supported by oath. Now, what is interesting is that a way to justify the violation of privacy is to come in the name of national security and the protection of the citizen. So after the Patriot Act was passed, which by the way, USA Patriot Act is an acronym, Congress passed the Uniting and strengthening Amer America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism. Act. That is the full name of the Patriot Act. What is the USA Patriot Act? Acronym. Uniting and strengthening America by providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism act of 2001. USA Patriot Act. Passed in October 2001, soon after September 11th, 2001 terrorist attack in New York City, signed into law by then President George W. Bush, October 26, 2001, reauthorized by President Bush in 2005 with some changes. Again, providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism. Do you see anything funny about that acronym? Well, what does providing appropriate tools mean and to interpret, intercept, intercept and obstruct terrorism? Hmm. Let us break this down. In 2001-2002, Friendster is launched. In 2002, LinkedIn is, LinkedIn is born for hiring agencies to locate new job applications. In the year 2003, Photo Buckets is launched in August of 2003. Here comes my MySpace, very interesting. By 2004, Facebook is created, but think about this. By 2015, MySpace is still, still had 50.6 million unique monthly visitors and had a pool of nearly 1 million active and inactive registered users. In June of 2009, MySpace employed approximately 1,600 employees. Now, what was it that the, that the USA Patriot Act stated? What was it for? Again, providing appropriate tools required to intercept and obstruct terrorism. So by the time Facebook was created, the government had already established a way to monitor the citizens, but in a way that the citizens would freely allow it. February of 2004, Flickr is launched. April of 2004, Facebook ads are launched to support experimental growth. June of 2005, Reddit is launched in February. Earlier in 2005, YouTube is born. July of 2005, My, MySpace reaches 22 million users and is growing at a rate of 2 million per month. By October of 2006, YouTube was acquired by Google for $1.65 billion. In March of 2006, Twitter is created. September 2006, the Facebook news feed section goes live by August of 2007. The hashtags start to come out on Twitter by October of 2008. Spotify is created. February of 2009, Facebook creates the like button. And by May of 2009, Facebook surpasses MySpace in users for the first time. By September of 2009, Facebook announces that it, that it is cash flow positive for the first time. By March of 2010, Pinterest goes live. By October of 2010, Instagram launches and hits 
1 million users within the first 60 days. July of 2011, Snapchat is launched, and by April of 2012, Facebook purchased Instagram for $1 billion. By October of 2012, Facebook reaches 1 billion active users. Now, something to be very mindful of at this point. October 2012, Facebook is now the largest social media site, having acquired Instagram and has, has not only heavily monitored, but Mark Zuckerberg is actively meeting with members of the government as it relates to information on citizens. We cannot forget the foundation of where it started and where it began. When it comes to information, once the Patriot Act was established, they had to create a way to have complete and total access to information on citizens, as well as foreign individuals. They wanted to monitor closely what information is coming in as well, as, what, as well as what is going out all under the guest of protecting the sovereignty and overall safety of American citizens even though at the same time, injustices are occurring on American soil, Facebook became, became the greatest honeypot for the CIA. The FBI, PENSA, PENSA, and all other forms of local state and federal government agencies to have access to any and every form of information that they would ever need. By December of 2012, Twitter hits 140 million active users. Snapchat by February of 2013, users are now sending 60 million snaps per day. With the Snapchat app, app you, of course, are giving your face and profiles dealing with facial recognition technology. And absolutely all of these having facial recognition technology. So the more you post, and have been posting and have posted, the more information you can ha have given up freely. Now let us pause for a moment here and take a look at the terms and conditions within the set selling of the apps that you have in your phone. Have you ever looked at the terms and conditions in the section of privacy for your Facebook app, Instagram app, Twitter app, YouTube app, Snapchat app, and all others? Have you ever actually read what it says? I think you might be very surprised to see some of the thing, things that you freely give up without knowing. For example, with the Facebook app, there are, there are nine overall areas for data, for data collection and their data pro policy. What kinds of information do they collect? How do they use the information? How is the, this information shared? How do the Facebook companies work together? How can you manage or delete information about yourself? How do they re respond to legal requests or prevent harm? How do they operate and transfer data, data as part of their global services? How would they notify you of changes to this policy and how to contact Facebook with questions? It all sounds very simple. It all sounds quite innocent. But if you analyze and look through e each of the each one of these options, you will notice something very interesting, which is they only tell you that they share whatever it is that you give them. Whatever you give them, they share. This also includes information that you pass through Messenger. This also includes law enforcement which is the sixth option in the data collection policy. All they need is something called good faith belief. And as, and as it states in one of the terms of services of Facebook, we may disclose information that you or your, <clears throat> or your use of our services to service providers or other partners that work on our behalf to support our business, e.g. E information processing and storage, providing place and recommendation, map thumbnails, and measuring the performance of our app. We may share information including personal identification, 
sheet information with our affiliates, companies that are part of our corporate groups of companies, including, but not limited to Facebook, to help provide and understand and improve our services. That's one of the main th things some people miss. The belief that the law requires them to give out certain information, and so they do it. Good faith belief. What, what this means is that you do not want to post things on social media that would incriminate you. Even though no intelligence person would post anything just impulsively because they feel like it would, because they feel like it without thinking or considering the repercussions, you must remember and understand that this is a network of information that is absolutely monitored. So whatever you put out, out will absolutely, absolutely find its way back to you one way or another. Whatever you put out, out also can neither be completely be taken off nor deleted from the internet. You can delete it from your, your own computer, from your phone, from your hard drive, or from your profile, but from the internet it will remain forever. And every app that we have downloaded we have given access to all of our information that we have in our phone or our computers or our tablets. So just understand that privacy is not something that we entirely have as long as we give them access. There is fantasy and there is fiction. When it comes to this, many people become confused because they, because they truly believe that they're being on social media means they are free. It, mean, it means they can say whatever they want. It means they can post about whatever they want and there will be no consequences. There is a level of carelessness. As a matter of fact, there is an insanely pregnant level of carelessness when it comes to posting your personal business as well as everything in your, in your life on social media. We truly think, think that posting a picture of us being at the pool will not affect us in any way. I know many of you may think, well, Riza, aren't you just a little paranoid? Are you possibly a bit worried about things? Are you being a little too serious? Are you a little over the top, excessive? Are you doing too much? And my question to you is, why in the hell with the, same, with the same government that makes money from your information being posted and who also monitors your every move give you, you the ability to freely circulate any and everything thing unless there was some agenda attached to it? Do you truly believe that they care about what you, you put on your toast? What color shoes you have? What type of costume your son or daughter wore for Halloween. No, these are additional pieces to the agenda. They allow you to do these things. These were the in incentives so that we would give up our freedom easily. So it is a fantasy. It is the apparent sea of free will. It is the apparent sea of carefree living. With freedom comes a level of control and with control comes a level of responsibility. If you are willing to give everything and place it in, in a unlimited universal arena, which is the internet, you also have to figure out, figure into the equation, the unlimited possibilities of how your information can be used against you. There are too many movies that have come out about this. There are too many, too many government mind control systems that are in place. They come out with Project Harp. They came out with, with Project Pegasus. They came out with Project Watchtower, Project Paperclip, Project Blooper, Bluebird, renamed uh, Artichoke Project, Project Bluebeam, Project MK, Naomi Project, 
MK Ultra. There are too many, many, far too many to name for us to truly sit back and believe that it is all simply free and that we should have nothing at all to worry about. Okay, well, I will. I will say this, those are not rocking the boat and those are not really doing anything. Don't have, don't have anything to worry about. But what if you are someone who jumped on the boat, didn't realize you were on a boat and were just floating along with everyone else. At a certain point, you woke up, you woke up and now that you want to rock the boat, it may be a little difficult. You may face the loss of something you love. You may face the loss of things you have become accustomed to having. You may face many difficult or uncomfortable things. So don't get caught up in the fiction of the, this thing that we call, call social media. Don't get caught up in the fantasy. Don't get caught up in giving yourself freely with posting every with posting every damn type of emotion you have, posting every argument you have, posting posting every situation that occurs when it, when it does not truly give a benefit to anyone, but the same type that benefits off off of your your off of your degradation degradation. Simply be mindful because the reality is much different. Okay, now what is reality and what is the fact? The fact is that everything that we post, everything that we com comment, everything that we say and do not and do on video and audio, as it pertains to not only social media, but our phone calls, our text messages, our emails, everything that we transfer through our ce cellular, cellular device, through our smart tablets, through our computers and everything electronic with a micro microchip is indeed recorded. Everything, this is everything. This is something that many people don't want to ha have to hear because it is very, very difficult to detach from a system that benefits, of course, from your degradation, but gives you the feeling of euphoria You feel like you are indestructible. You feel that you can do anything and there will be no consequences. But the fact is that what you post can be used against you in a court of law. What you post can be used against you when you travel from state to state. What you post does affect your, internet, your international travel and your entry into other countries. They study what you post they study what you, you do, and it transfers everywhere. Yeah, for example, American journalist Glenn Greenwald and former CIA employee and subcontractor Edward Snowden have outlined all of this information in complete and total detail. The first report that Glenn Greenwald published in the Guardian newspaper in 2013 revealed that under a top secret order issued by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, that Verizon was forced to give the FBI the metadata from millions of American phone calls. In actuality, this was manifest in 2015. In many instances, metadata is more invasive than listening to the content of your calls or even reading your emails. Metadata is the data about your communication. So instead of listening to your phone calls and hearing what you're saying on the phone call, or reading your email, which is content. They will collect the information about who it is that is calling you, how often they are calling you, the duration of all of the call, their location, when they're calling you, who you are emailing, who was emailing you, what machines are being used, and where you are physically when you do it. For instance, if you are a woman who is making an appointment to an abortion, to have an abortion. And if you call an abortion clinic, the poor person who's just listening to that call 
is not going to hear anything other than the highlight to make an appointment for two o'clock tomorrow. However, if you if that person is monitoring the metadata of the call, they will see that this woman has called an abortion clinic and an in-depth analysis of local specifics of whom she wishes to see, including who the caller is. Another example would be of somebody with HIV making an appointment to talk to their HIV doctor. Listening to the content of the call will reveal very little, but knowing the metadata of who you're calling or who you're going to see can reveal a lot. Okay, let's break down how serious this is. Same applies with human rights activists talking to informants. Even whistleblowers in dangerous places. Hmm, can you see the potentially dangerous implications such of such a seemingly simple intrusion of privacy? Metadata allows the government to learn far more about you than even the content does. And what it also does is it enables them to create a huge picture of your life, a picture of, of who your associations are, who the people are that you talk to, even who, who they communicate with. Whether your network or friends is close, knit, near, far, large, small, etc., it is a very, very complete picture of what your life is without having to read a single email or listening to a call. And for those who are running around saying, well, listen, I don't care what they record. I have nothing to hide. It does, doesn't matter to me. I'm not a criminal. I'm not a terrorist, etc., etc. A lot of people say this, but I think there are very, very few people who believe that that every time somebody has said that, yeah, okay. What if you are saying, I don't care what the government sees or what they see me doing because there is nothing that I'm doing that is illegal, etc., or whatever. Okay. Please do this one thing for everyone and accept this challenge. If you will, post all the pa passwords to all of your social media accounts. Then post your emails or both emails and their respective passwords. Then post your cell phone, phone number, home phone number, as well as your bank information and passcodes, etc. And afterwards, just let us us and everyone all over the internet go through it and see whatever we, we'd like to see. Now, honestly, ask yourself, would you be willing to do that? No? Why not? See, even though we are social creatures and political individuals who need human interaction, we have to ma maintain some sort of public identity. Equally essential to who we are is how safe we are able to maintain our privacy. It is simply intrinsic to our nature to have a degree and level our and level of, of safety and solitude with those things that we do not wish to disclose to the public. It is natural. There is nothing wrong with it. It makes you neither a criminal nor a terrorist. Neither does it mean you are plotting to overthrow a government, nor are you wanting to do something that is illegal. It does not mean you wish anything negative, otherwise harmful to any other human beings. It simply means that you are a human being with the right to safeguard and secure your information, belongings, your family, friends, and anything else that you see as valuable and could be harmed if full access to them was given free of conditions or restrictions. So it's easy to say that it sounds nice. It makes you seem as though you are this angelic figure who is completely powerful and in control and carefree. But in reality, there is almost no one who will do that and almost no one who believes that. Inter interestingly enough, The Guardian, as well as 
The Washington Post revealed that the NSA, the National Security Agency, has access to the central servers of nine major internet companies. Among these are Google, Yahoo, Apple, and Facebook through a top secret surveillance program called PRISM, also known as SIGAD US 984XN. Huge numbers of people, mirror to hundreds of millions, probably billions, use Google and Yahoo for their online activities. The fact of the U.S. government is essentially breaking into the systems. The pathways in which this data is transported enables them to bulk vacuum. All of it that shows the mindset of the NSA that they are truly interested in eliminating privacy globally, by which I mean they want all forms of human electronic communication to be vulnerable to their surveillance net. The fact that they do, do this, even while they have the prison system in place, this already enables them to acquire vast sums of information from the NSA, from the internet, companies, rather, from their servers, is something that just shows how extreme they've become in terms of institutional devotion to gathering as much as they can. Some people, some people will say, well, listen, this is a necessary thing. We are trying to protect our country. We are trying to protect ourselves from terrorists and people who can potentially do things that are harmful to us as a people, as citizens as a nation within our borders, without our, without our borders. Some of them have already in, infiltrated our country and they are here and we need to know who they are. They may be plotting to attack us and do something completely horrible and terrible and you know, you've seen 9-11, etc., etc., etc. We make those kinds of judgments all the time and those statements all the time. But if, for example, we installed monitors in everyone's home and enabled authorized police to enter people's homes with no warrant needed, and they can just walk in and whenever they want, there's no question that crime will go down totally. It will be much harder to be a rapist or a pedophile or a murderer. Of course, get around any person being captured if there were monitors everywhere inside your home Outside, outside your home, etc. Especially if the police could just enter at any given moment. However, we don't make that choice because we would rather have a higher risk of criminality than live within a society in which privacy has been completely undermined and virtually eradicated. One of the first things to discuss is the huge amount, amount of spying that we are talking about we are talking about actually has nothing to do with terrorism or na national security. It has to do with economic espionage, with monitoring the population, the population. It has to do with monitoring the population indiscriminately to augment the power of those who control the spying machine. Terrorism is the fear mongering slogan that those in power have used over the last 12 or more years to engender submission to authority. It has nothing to do, do with the reality of why the spying program is actually being constructed. The proof of that, that is that it is very rare, rarely directed at actual terrorists. Far more often than not, it is directed at those who have no conception what terrorism is, nor are they actively involved in any form of terrorism whatsoever. The United States has an over $40 billion security system where they can monitor anything that comes in and goes out of not only the country, but in and out of their servers. Anything that goes through their servers, through technology and phones and emails, 
and the internet can be monitored. So they have the, cap have the capability of catching virtually anyone they want. So what is the true reality? Because it is an absolute lie that all of this surveillance, all of this invasion of privacy, all of this lack of true freedom, all of true freedom of the people in some way needs to be policed like this. Far more of the, of the satellites are turned inward into the United States versus being turned outward to protect the United States. If you're go going to look at the debates of the Patriot Act, there were people who were standing up and saying this is a radical piece of legislation, that this is really dangerous and abandonment of all our values. They didn't anticipate that the Patriot Act would be used for collection of everybody's communication. Even those people painting the grimmest pictures of the Patriot Act leading to war warned that it had lowered standard too much from po probable cause to just relevance, thus enabling the government to target people too easily. Everybody assumed even the most serious is of those opposing the Patriot Act that the focus was going to be seriously targeted investigations. Nobody thought the Patriot Act will be distorted, misinterpreted, to authorize and justify bulk and discrimination, indiscriminate suspicion list collection of the communication data of every single citizen in America. The way it has been, there, there's no more transparencies. There's no question that the more they collect, the harder it, it is to find the things that they claimed they're trying to find. So for instance, if you're collecting as the NSA is 1.9 billion emails and telephone calls every single day and close to 25 billion emails and telephone calls from around the world every single day, the problem that you have is that you're collecting so much that you can e even actually store the da data effectively, which is why they're building this massive facility in Bluffdale. Utah, a data center that is used to install and house de data that was collected. It becomes very difficult to find the actual terrorist attack. The, analog the analogy they always like to use is that we're looking for a needle in the haystack. But the more hay you collect, the bigger the hay haystack and the harder it is to find the needle. That's why it's so obvious that terrorism is not the driving force behind this, this system. Let us analyze the motives critically and logically. If you are someone who exercises power and you can know everything about what everybody else is doing, what they say, what they read, what they think, what they plan, what they are, in, what they are interacting with and with whom interactions occur while at the same time build a wall of secrecy see, around what it is that you're doing so that nobody can actually see or know what it is that you are reading, doing, it's a bit hypocritical. The power difference becomes blatant which is why all tyrannies instinctively use surveillance as one of their principal weapons because the more you know about the world and about the people, the more you can manipulate and control them. Additionally, the less that wor world knows about you, the less leverage they have over you. It is really at its core about simply increasing the power of the United States government vis-a-vis -vis its own population and pop populations around the world. 
there are powers that are the hallmark of tyranny, one of which is mass indiscriminate suspicion list and surveillance that the United States government is increasingly relying upon to maintain the control and to shield itself from legitimate challenge. Whether somebody wants to call that tyranny or not, that's up to you. Whether you want to call it sy systemic oppression, that is up to you. What is that, that power which is clearly tyrannical in nature? The interesting point is that the al alternative media sources who have broadcast about, about this, who have brought this out, have explained this, and who have risked their careers within these alternative media networks have been attacked and, and an attempt to discredit them has been pushed all over the country. For example, Wikile WikiLeaks, the website which promotes the access of the Freedom of Information Act and, and encourages people to look deeper into government files and information to guarantee that we are truly living in a free country. As the aforementioned alternative media sources have experienced Having their credibility targeted, Wiki, WikiLeaks, of course, publishes news from anonymous sources. Many of these, which happen to be whistleblowers, are attacked heavily. This is for the simple fact that this government in no way is free or democratic in its willingness to have the public become aware of what it is truly doing while simultaneously wanting to know everything that the public is doing, doing. If we are to truly trust social media, mainstream media, and this government with any form of media, it has to come, come to us on the basis of the zero knowledge system. This is a system that is usual, utilized by specific companies where they allow you to store information, send and receive documentation on their server but they do not have access to the content. They only have access to the quantity, and that is about it. One of these systems, for example, is, is something called the Spider Oak. Spider Oak is the zero knowledge form uh, or format simula similar to what we call Dropbox. Dropbox, however, being utilized through Google, can have access to all the content that you store on it. They can look at every document, every word, every page, video, picture, and every file. While at the same time, law enforcement is supposed to have to go to a judge to get the encryption key from you, you to access your files, the majority of, it, of these companies do not need to do such so a zero knowledge based system is what we must move back into in order for the integrity to be restored. The trust needs to be restored from the people for the government. According to the Edward Snowden, he stated, quote, we shouldn't trust them. He was having a conversation with the Guardian newspaper and he was specifying that Skype Google Hangouts, and others have been compromised. Anything that you transfer or record through Skype and Google Hangouts, etc., can not only be monitored by, but monitored, but can be played back. It can be weeks, months, or even over a year. The United Kingdom collects data, and they hold on to that, that data between six weeks to three months. On the United States, they usually hold on to the data for about a year and that data that they hold on that they hold on to is more of the actual data rather than simply general content so they make sure to hold on to every detail of again who you talk to what you speak about the location that you are in physically what device you have and who made the device including all the documents and files you have on that device so so on and 
so forth. Also, according to Snowden, the auditing of these systems is very weak and no one truly monitors the auditing. No. So any of this data can be sifted, yeah, thoroughly evaluated, and there is no such thing as a morality offer, officer. In the NSA, the CIA, and the FBI, and others to simply go in and check the moral appeal, intent, and the reasoning behind the collection of such data. This is why he exposed this and left the United States. It is being said now that the attention span of those within the general public is less than 12 seconds, specifically the, those who were born between 1981 and the, two, and the year 2000. They are projecting that the attention span will shorten and become even less of this reaching the low of about five to eight seconds. Have you ever noticed that on Instagram, the video length is 60 seconds or 59.9 seconds? And as you scroll down, you scroll and scroll and scroll. You are mentally being conditioned to have an attention span of a ma maximum of 60 seconds. Then they in instituted and created the IGTV to give you up to 10 minutes of video play. If you upload from a cellular device or more, if you upload from a computer, as you scroll, scroll, it becomes a numbering effect. It becomes a numbing effect on the mind. You become used to seeing things that are negative. You become used to seeing things that are funny. You become used to seeing things that are quick and fast paced. So in mind, it is firing and pumping neurons very quick, but much of the inf information is not necessarily useful. So by the time you attempt to access your mental power and capability, it isn't as strong as it was prior to using social media. As you're scrolling on your device, you will notice that some people are now developing a small hump and their back because of the position they are in when they are scrolling and using their phone to scroll through social media. It is a condition called Do Doeger's hump. <clears throat> that condition people are now developing by having their head tilted forward for an elongated period of time while scrolling through social media from the scrolling through pictures, scrolling through videos, scrolling through text, um, just scrolling through everything, scrolling, 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 snatching up mental power while affecting the physical body and all this, and all of this while the world is passing us by. It even has a high effect on the self-esteem. The more li likes we receive, the better we feel. The less likes we receive, we begin to question, is this picture cute enough? Did they not like my outfit? Why did I get more likes on a picture of my body? But when I post up a picture to support this GoFundMe, I get far less because there's something wrong with, wrong with me. Did I post at the wrong time? What's wrong? What's wrong? Why aren't they why aren't that many people watching my video? I spent hours on this. Why are they not sharing this? They must not like me. I don't understand. We have now based our self-esteem on a fictional, not fixatious, fake system of validation. We actually care more about what people we have never met before think rather than the people who live in, who live with or the people we actually see every day in our actual life. Suicide rates have gone up for those who receive less likes on their post. People have deactivated accounts because they did not receive enough attention. People have had mental breakdowns because not enough people watch their live videos. And this is not simply on Instagram. This is on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and all other social media platforms. 
the administrators behind these social media networks understand how, how to manipulate algorithms within the system to drive a percentage of your overall following or your overall subscribers to your videos or how to cut off or cut down your following or your subscribers so that more or less of them will see it when you post them or when you activate it. We are becoming more artificial than real. Some of us cannot go for one hour without being on our phone. We read less, we communicate to face, we communicate face to face with each other less. We go outside and spend time with real people less. And even when we do go out and spend time with people, physically, mentally, we are still in virtual reality. Some will go to parties, some will go to family gatherings, some will go to events and graduations and meetings and will sit right next to the same person who they are texting on their phone. It has the capacity to enhance the experience of gathering information and the covenant access thereof. <laughs> this is why they, call, they called it a smartphone. Not because it makes you more intelligent, because the majority of us are not using it to enhance our, our intellect by studying lectures or reading online or doing things that enhance our actual intelligence. Most are using it for entertainment, music, videos, etc. But it is a smartphone because it gains more intelligence about us from what it, from what it is that we put into it. <clears throat> so what it is when you are physically next to someone, but rather than using your lips and the thoughts from your brain and your mind to communicate directly to that person, you'd rather go through technology to communicate with them. What does this mean? Where is this going? How serious is this becoming? <laughs> and if you are reading this, feeling as though it is too serious or excessive or ridiculous, this lead illogical, then you may be guilty of being artificial. We have to get back to reality before we lose our minds to technology. And once that happens, the future will be very, very dark. Elon Musk is said to have now come out with a way to install a computer chip into the rain that will connect your thoughts directly to a computer. Now, how in the hell would anyone in their right mind accept such a procedure? So for those of, of us who are intellectuals, the first thing we would think is if I have the capability of accessing multiple forms of knowledge, thousands of books at one time, and installing all of the all of the information from these books and these lectures, and all of this information and knowledge all at one time directly into my brain, I would do it. But what would be the cost? Would it simply be as innocent as a computer chip giving us access to an unlimited source of knowledge so that we can utilize it, this information to help ourselves, to help our families and our people in our community? Or would this be a double-edged sword for instance, information coming in, in, but also information going out. Would this be another way to access, of accessing our innermost deep secret and private thoughts for a government that is built on lies and who loves the access to what it is that you may think? Would they not see this as an opportunity to take full advantage of and to completely take it? over our mental facilities to create an entire generation of mental zombies, seeing how they have already done it with social media. Why stop there? The CIA itself has already stated that they have the ability to install not only ideas for personalities, but total personalities. Have you ever seen the movie Total Recall, starring Arnold Schwartz and Megan Fox? Arnold believed he was an average man, but it turned out that he was a secret government agent and they installed a complete personality in his head and set up a wife and an entire life around him that was not his own. Have you ever heard of the 
brainwash manual where they utilize the information and techniques that the CIA and the, and the German government created through psychology to install command phrases in the mind to create assassins and terrorists. Do you know that many, if not all, of the suicide bom bombers were given implants? <laughs> First, did you know that the CIA has a program called PDH, Pain Drug Hypnosis, where they not only kidnap you, but once they kidnap you, they install by way of pain first, then drugging second, then hypnosis, third total commands and actions for you to carry out. The man who murdered John Lennon from the Beatles, whose name was Mark David Chapman, was given this procedure. Many of the individuals you have heard of com committed murders and had any recollect recollection of ever doing so and did not know what happened after they had conducted the murder of the assassination. Where do they have another form of PDH or installing commands? Now, it is called psychotropic drugs and psychiatric medication. Nearly every single one, one of these medications have an F effect which is not a side effect. Although they try to use that phrase to lessen the damage, but it is a direct effect of homicide, suicide and homicidal thoughts and tendencies, as well as suicidal thoughts and tendencies. Nearly every mass shooter from Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold and Colombian were exposed to these medications. Eric Harris was a Lubox all the way to the Batman shooter who was on multiple psychi psychotropic drugs. Even the Virginia the tech shooter was on multiple psychiatric, psychiatric drugs all the way down. They utilized these procedures and they put them into chemistry. So what does, wait, so what goes and moves from the one form of extreme to another. Social media is one. Mainstream media, of course, is another. Then if they cannot install enough to program you enough by mentally manipulation, they will do it by physical means to affect the mind. This is why we have to move away from being so engulfed in media, media, media at least once a week. We need to step away from all mainstream as well as social media platforms for at least one day out of the week to reprogram our minds. Get back to family, get back to going outside, get back to being involved in social gatherings and events where the government or shall I say your cell phone is not present. Even, even for some who just read what the thought itself is difficult to comprehend. What leave my phone at home or leave my phone in the car or put my phone on silent in my pocket? Are you serious? I can't do that. Listen, if it were a matter of life and death, many still wouldn't do it. Many still couldn't do it. And this simply demonstrates our addiction that we come that we must come out of. We must get back to reality. That is chapter two.